All right, let's pick up where we left off last time. So we were, we were still on our introduction to physical oceanography and, and our gross introduction to the ocean. We talked last time about some basic stuff, and we ended right where we were starting to get into talking about materials that had dropped out of the water column, had precipitated out of the water column, primarily by biological activity. And so last time we left off with the notion, having just discussed the notion of um, you know, why is it that our oceans don't get a whole lot saltier or a whole lot fresher over time, that there's this gross stability, this steady state. And we said that it's because, yes, we do have this so-called rinsing of the earth, volcanoes throwing salts and other materials into the water, uh, uh, rain and other precipitation eroding materials from the terrestrial surface into the ocean. Um, and then we have this precipitation where stuff is being removed from it. And as we said before, there are some gross geographic patterns that are responding to currents and upwellings and things of that nature. The productivity of the water of the um, overlying water column that is leading to different critters being rained out of the uh, water, out of the ocean. One thing that this um, is leading to now is this notion of deep sea mining. is actually going in and maybe trying to pull some of this material from the bottom of the ocean. And this is an interesting story that really is a classic case of the challenges and the, and the idiosyncratic nature of some of the the situations we're often faced with in coastal marine management. We'll talk about deep sea mining in depth in a second, but let's start talking about um, how we got to this notion of deep sea mining. We got to this notion of deep sea mining partly due to the Cold War. So in 1968, the Cold War was, in the 1960s, the Cold War was fast and furious. It was cranking. It was going going full steam. Russians are trying to invent stuff. Americans are trying to invent stuff. And it's just getting crazy. In 1968, we lose four submarines. There's an American. We lose the Scorpion. Uh, we lose, uh, there's an Israeli submarine that goes down. There's a French submarine. And there is a Russian, a Soviet, I should say, Soviet submarine that goes down. The Soviet submarine that goes down is known as K-129. It's a picture of it here from these old Soviet archives. Um, it is a ballistic missile cruiser, meaning it has missiles on board that can fire from general... Eventually, I don't remember if they could do this in 1968, in the late 1960s, but, but they could fire from underwater and sometimes now very far underwater without revealing your position. They can launch and they can essentially fly across continents or fly across oceans. And so, the, so nuclear submarines, and, and, then, and then these guys were nuclear powered, so they didn't have to rely on diesel or something like that and come to the surface every so often. They, they had, in effect, unlimited power and could stay. And then because of the, the benefits that gave them in terms of air purification, water, desalination, etc., they could stay underwater as long as their food stores uh, held out. So this gave uh, the possibility of parking these things that could cause Armageddon anywhere in the ocean. So it was a huge thing. So we sunk an insane amount of money, insane amount of time into inventing these technologies, countering these technologies, etc. And that'll be a theme we'll see throughout the semester in terms of people's fear and panic and hatred are often some of the greatest spurs to make the technological innovations in leaps. So for example, compact disks. We have compact disks because of nuclear submarines and the need to embed a bunch of data on um, compact uh, information source. Uh, you know, all this stuff. Our interstate highway system, um, the internet, all this stuff comes out of this jazz. Anyway, um, so K-129 sinks in 1968. Now, the Soviets have a very 
uh, poor, at least in comparison to the Americans' underwater network. So they lose this. So this was this was not not technically a shakedown cruise, but it was one of its earliest cruises. It disappears. All hands on deck, gone. Um, now, one of the strengths of these submarines is they could go deep. They could go hide, right? And they could be hard to detect. Well, if you have a poor network to track these things, that's not essentially a good thing if you lose your submarine. You don't know where your submarine is, right? And that's what happened in this case. So the Americans that are monitoring the activities of the Soviet military realize that they lose this, they, they've lost this vessel. The Americans were tracking the submarine based on um, some of the sensor networks at the time. And so they knew at least roughly in the vague area where it was. The Soviets go looking for it and they're, they're 500, 1,000 miles away. They don't, they're not looking in the right place. Um, and so eventually the Soviets give up and they just say it's you know, lost at sea, no explanation, don't know what's going on, etc. So the Americans see this as an opportunity to go and retrieve Soviet technology, learn what they're doing, learn how they built this thing, all that kind of stuff. So um, we, uh, it ends up settling at the bottom almost five kilometers deep. So this is really deep in the ocean, right? This is in the Pacific, really, really deep. It's northwest of Hawaii, whereas the Soviets are searching more like around Alaska and the Kamchatka Peninsula. They're, they're looking all over, but they're, they're not looking where it was. So we send one of our um, essentially reconnaissance submarines out, and they take something like 20,000 photographs. They take all these, these, these photographs and these, these um, you know, sonar castings and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they, they, they can tell that this is the submarine they're looking for, but they, it's still too deep for the technology at the time to go do anything uh, with. But it's a Cold War, and unlike today, the government had money and was willing to spend it. And so they try to figure out what can we do, and they say, well, we need a cover story, because if we start to go out there with a bunch of American military craft, and start to um, dig around or this or that, the Soviets are gonna figure out what's going on, right? And this is in international waters. This is not, not, not in someone's territories. It's not in Hawaiian waters. So it's not as if it was in our backyard and we could say this is ours now. So if the Soviets found that we were trying to dig this thing up, they would say, dude, what are you doing? That's mine. You can't, you can't take that, right? So we needed a cover story and so their cover story was, of course, to get Mr. Insane, Howard Hughes, involved. And so this is the, the Howard Hughes that built Hughes Aircraft. At this point, he's become, he has some mental illness and he's you know, becoming something of a recluse and all this and that. But nevertheless, his company, Howard, the, the Hughes um, Corporation, was still incredibly powerful, incredibly inventive, a great home for a whole host of engineers. And so the CIA says, maybe we can use Howard Hughes to help us go find the submarine. So they build this thing that's originally called the Hughes Glomar Explorer. I just uh, uh, posted a story, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you guys, um, from uh, last week saying this vessel, unfortunately it, the name changed, but um, is just being retired as of last week. So this, this, this vessel built in the late 60s, early 70s, and then modified since then, uh, which was a deep sea drilling ship, uh, was basically in use since that time. So Howard Hughes invents this uh, story that we're gonna get rich by going and mining the bottom of the ocean. So we're gonna, and he's a he's, you know, billionaire, and he's going to go build this billionaire toy. They're going to sail out around the world and they're going to go mine the bottom of the ocean. And that worked. That worked. Everybody thought this weirdo crazy dude was, this is just another one of those weirdo crazy dude things. Um, it stayed a secret for several years. The operation to go retrieve material from the Soviet sub takes several years. 
1974, and then there's some leaks to the press in 1975. First, the LA Times publishes a story, and then uh, shortly thereafter, the New York Times runs a story. As you see here, CIA salvage ship brought up part of Soviet lost sub in 68, failed to raise a atomic missiles. So they didn't get everything they, they didn't get everything they wanted to, but they and we still don't necessarily know everything we got. There's a de there's a declassified report on the CIA's webpage if you guys are so interested. Um, but but they definitely could get some you know some structural ideas um, and and things of that nature. But this came out later, right? So in the in the early 70s, Howard Hughes is doing all this investment. And he does it through Canada. So the Canadians are investing in mining. What? So this starts, this spurs a bunch of other people to say, wait a second, if these guys are doing deep sea mining, maybe we should do deep sea mining. And uh, just a, another coastal marine management note for us in California. It also, um, uh, Packard is one of the engineers they, they asked for his expertise to help design some stuff. And, 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 that in turn spurs some of his thinking in terms of building, designing some of the pumps that are used in the um, giant kelp tank in the Monterey Bay Aquarium. At the time, the, the deepest tank and the, the largest aquarium in the world. So all kinds of things come out of this. Um, but this is what those guys said they were going for, right? So in theory, this made sense from a financial standpoint that if we could go get these supposedly uh, free minerals, we could refine those minerals, use them in manufacturing and production of products, and it would make a you know it would make a huge um, financial splash, and we'd make a lot of money. Basically, what most folks are going after are um, metal precipitates, um, and what we're talking about here is stuff that has come right out of the water column. Oh, usually there's something that's catalyzing the precipitation. Um, a piece of clay, maybe a, a shell of a critter. And the classic things people talk about are manganese nodules. And you see those here in the, in the picture here. So these guys on the right are standing next to a, a incredibly large example of one. More typically, they're golf ball size, they're fist size, the more, the more typical um, size. And... Um, essentially, it's it's a it's a just a chemical precipitation process where over time these substances are coming out of the water and essentially just like a tree ring laying on an extra layer, an extra layer, an extra layer, and those are growing, growing, growing. So what you see here is this is a, a shot from an ROV, and you see the this is really what we have. We have fields of these things. It's not as if it's a big, pure, continuous strip of ore. It's rather um, almost like it rained hail balls, but instead of being hail, they're these uh, metallic precipitates. So um, people are now interested in actually mining the bottom of the ocean. To and, and in some cases, the mining is like this, just going and scraping up, essentially scooping up these balls. Um, but we can mine other things as well. So one thing we have down at uh, uh, down deep because remember it's cold down there right the average depth of the ocean is greater than three kilometers it is not in sunlight it is just barely above freezing and so with one thing we can get down there is we can get so-called gas hydrates so this is um, um, essentially solid uh, solid um, natural gas It is um, a matrix of water where we have these gas molecules inside of this container. And here's an example. A guy has one of these, and we just took a match and lit it on fire, and you see it's, it's catching on fire. So potentially a source of, of energy. Um, these gas hydrates, these essentially slushy, slushy of methane slushy, we could maybe call it, is what caused one of our efforts to cap the deep water horizon to fail. So, so we try to put this essentially hat over that big, um, uh, the, the severed well bore, and there's too many of these slushy things basically clogged up the, the tube and weren't, didn't allow us to suck that, those hydrocarbons back up to the surface. 
So we have all this, this kind of wonderful stuff on the bottom of the ocean, and, and traditionally it's been way too deep. No one would ever think of trying to mine something five kilometers straight down in the ocean or four kilometers or whatever it is. But with current technology, that's changed stuff. So originally, after Hughes started investing in all this deep sea mining stuff, like I said, it spurred something of a mini boom in deep sea mining. Almost all those corporations went bankrupt. Almost all those things, you know, it was not financially viable. The CIA was giving Howard Hughes billions of dollars to pretend like he was mining, right? So then how could you not make money, right? Um, some of those, some of that technology went into um, the oil industry. Some of that technology went into academic research, like the Glomar Explorer. Uh, but, but most of the, those investments went belly up. Now things have changed. So in the last couple years, technology has gotten to the point and robotics have gotten to the point and the cheapness of, of control systems and things of that nature have gotten to the point where we can actually do this now. So what we're looking at here is, um, uh, this is sort of a critique, um, but uh, mining off of Papua New Guinea, the Solara One project. Um, which is actually proposing in this case not to go take uh, not to take uh, nodules per se, but to come in to some of these um, smokers, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, deep sea vents, and so we have a bunch of this mineral-rich uh, liquid pouring out of the bottom of the ocean, and just like the mineral precipitates or the nodule precipitates, we're getting this deposition of metals, gold, that kind of stuff around these things. So these guys are basically talking about l letting robots go down, bzz, cut off these things, bzz, put them in a basket, and then raise that basket up to the surface and, and do mining. And these and this, this it took a long time. This has been controversial. A uh, lot of environmental impact statements and assessments were done. And essentially, it, it started um, about two years ago. It's had some bumps in the road, but it's basically happening. Um, and now other countries like the Cook Islands, where we were this summer, other places are now starting to seriously look at this. And a lot of people think they can do this with minimal environmental impact. Uh, but, um, but in any event, this is coming. So what was born out of a Cold War rush to get Soviet technology has now finally, 40 years later, matured to the point where we can actually mine these things. Okay, continuing on, um, we another key aspect of seawater that you, or the ocean you guys should know is diff, is issues related to density and how that density changes. So what I'm showing you guys here is the uh, basic relationship between salinity and temperature. What we're seeing right here. Uh, so okay, so sorry. This is temperature on the uh, y-axis, salinity on the x, going from relatively low to relatively high. With as you guys know, typical seawater is is you know is something around 34, 35 parts per thousand. And we're looking at the specific gravity here, or the density here, with each of these curves. These are isoclines. So anywhere we are on this particular curve the water is the same density. Recall, if something is more dense, it's going to tend to sink. If it's less dense, it's going to tend to float. So what we see here is we can change the density of seawater um, a couple different ways. We can uh, add salt to the water, which is going to, in effect, make it more dense. Or we can change the temperature, which will have the same uh, effect. So for example, if we were talking about um, uh, water that was uh, 10 degrees Celsius, uh, that had a um, salinity of 30 parts per thousand, that's going to be the same density, won't float up, won't float down, as water that is 30 degrees Celsius. Where would my pointer go? Where we go? As as um, as um, water that's 30 degrees Celsius and uh, about 36 and whatever, the 36.8 parts per thousand. Everybody with me on that? Make sense? And so what we see here is that 
dense seawater is going to sink. And so that tends to be cold water. Water that tends to flow tends to be warm water. And in a, in a super simplified version here of the Earth, here we go, latitude. So the, here at the equator, and then we're going towards the South Pole here or towards the North Pole here. And, and um, Klein is, is, a, is a rapid change in something. So if we're talking about salinity, or excuse me, that's not right. If we're talking about density, if we're talking about density, we call it a pycnocline. And so pycno is P-Y-C-N-O, cline. We can have a thermocline, which is the same thing with regards to temperature. We can have a halo cline, which is the same idea in terms of salt. Um, and so what we have is we have um, uh, towards the poles, we tend to have sinking water, cold sinking water. So uh, remember I said that the salinity is pretty much close to 34 parts per thousand or so. It varies a little teeny bit in surface waters. Again, um, this is going to be determined. Uh, this is basically being driven by the physics of the ocean that the tropics are getting hot, right? Uh, and have the, have the, has the sun bearing down on it. The polar areas are colder. The polar areas also tend to have more things like snow and ice and stuff melting. Now this is, this is I'm just showing you salinity, the very, very topmost layer of the, uh, the surface water of the ocean. So salinity is gonna vary with latitude, but, and also, um, because of that pattern I just described, the, the, the dry, warm areas near the poles, generally speaking, hot areas, uh, and differences in rainfall patterns, we tend to get these areas where we have, um, where precipitation and evaporation are not equal. So in some areas we get uh, more rain on average, some areas we get uh, uh, more evaporation on average, and that's gonna affect the surface water salinity slightly. Um, having no, knowing nothing else, if we didn't, have, if the Earth was not spinning, if we didn't have all the other stuff, the difference in density alone can make water move. If we had no propellers, if we had no ships, if we had no wind, just the dent, the, the differences in density, um, this part of the water will tumble down, and that's going to tend to shove the other water up, etc. And so where you can um, see that would be somewhere like the Black Sea. The Black Sea is, is right here in, in, near Turkey where we work. And, um, and there we, we have very little major ocean circulation, um, but much of the movement of the water is driven by just differences in um, density. Okay. We're starting to form this picture now of the ocean. We have these diff we, we know something about the depth. We know something about salinity, this and that. And so we, this stuff begins to come together. In the real world, the Earth is spinning. In the real world, we have seasons, stuff like that. And this is what we get. We get uh, m predictable, consistent, movement of water masses. There's always variation. There's always little pockets and things that change. But overall, we see these large scale patterns that happen year in and year out. And have a look at this. Here's the equator. Here's the northern polar region. Here's the southern polar region. And check it out. We tend to have these cyclonic, these circular movements going on where generally speaking, let, let, let's take the, the Southern Pacific here as an example. Generally speaking, we have water movement, <laughs> Gesundheit, at the latitude of the tip of South America, we have water that's moving um, from the west towards the east. It's coming, it essentially bangs up against South America and has to go somewhere and it tends to go north. This is, this is the so-called Peruvian current and it goes north, but it doesn't go north up to us. It goes north and then it bends and it doesn't, it does not cross the equator. 
and then it and then it now this water generally speaking on average there, there are counter currents and gyres but on average it's going to go from in this case where to go in this case from the east to the west and this is what we don't pay that much attention to but this was key to the exploration of the world by our seafaring nations, by the Chinese, by the Polynesians, by the Europeans, all that kind of stuff. So these guys knew that, that if you were kind of stuck and you wanted to go from, say, New Zealand to South America, kind of go to this area. And the water is kind of going to, going to go more that way. There's also the wind pattern we can talk about. And the same thing, if we wanted to, go, if we wanted to float something from, from you know, let's say, um, the northern tip of uh, South America to get over to you know, Indonesia or something like that, let's let's start around here so we get this consistent movement um, and that's going to be moving all kinds of stuff okay let's take a pause in terms of talking about our uh, salinity and stuff and say that not only does salinity change and have variation over large scales and and can we look at that over the scale of the equator to the poles we can also talk about the effect of salinity and salinity difference at a very small scale. So let's talk about um, organisms. So here we have uh, an example of a marine a fish that's living in the ocean and a fish that's living in the fresh water. Does anybody have fish at home? Is it? No? <laughs> okay. Wow. Great. That was a good, that was a good audience participation question. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so freshwater fish or saltwater fish? Uh, freshwater fish. Um, so just, just, so uh, what, what would happen if we threw your freshwater fish in uh, salt water? Would die. die, right, would die. Um, one of the common things uh, if people that have saltwater uh, fish can do, sometimes these guys will get paras ectoparasites, maybe a little worm, maybe a little, little crustacean. And one of, the, one of the classic ways you would get a parasite, let's say, off of your fish, a so marine fish, is to get a bucket of fresh water, what, sounds torturous, and take your marine fish, dunk them really quickly in that fresh water bath for two, three, four, five seconds, and then scoop them up and put them back in salt water. The fish will not like that. <laughs> the fish will be freaking out. Why, 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 is that, why does that fish freak out when we <clears throat> toss him in um, fresh water? Anybody know? Right, because because fish are vertebrates. They're they're they need oxygen. So what they're doing is, as we mentioned last time, we have all these dissolved gases in water. They're actually their physiology is designed to suck out these little dissolved chunks of air from the water. Goes over their gills. Those gills are a very, very fine membrane that it's going to allow diffusion of oxygen or carbon dioxide or whatever it is and exchange their, uh, the concentration of that material in the water with that in their blood. So that's very sensitive. So the reason fish or whoever freak out when we pick them out of a salt water tank and put them in fresh water is because all of a sudden their lungs start, start to explode on them. They pop with, due to the osmotic difference, osmotic potential. So that, that's not good. So the idea is you do it really quickly and the fish are like, oh, and if the fish can clamp down on his gills and just hold on for a second or two, it usually won't kill him. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be super stoked, but it's not necessarily lethal. However, if you're one of these parasites on the skin of this fish and we do this, you don't have any refuge and they tend, they don't have, you know, tend to not have um, things protecting their gills and stuff. So they usually die. So that's the idea. The idea is you can do a freshwater dunk to kill these ectoparasites, but if you do it quick enough, it won't kill the fish. All right. Now we have critters that sometimes live across salinity gradients. So here's a classic image. Here's, a, here's a, um, an estuary. So over here is ocean, so pure marine. Up here we see a freshwater river or, or a creek. And so this is pure freshwater. So an estuary is essentially a mixing zone 
where it's not fully marine, it's not fully fresh. It's betwixt and between. Oh, look, I just said that. So there you go. Um, okay, so, so the salinity can vary from essentially, depending on where, what time of day and depending on where we are in the estuary itself, it can range from pure marine or almost exactly pure marine to pure fresh. And so some critters have evolved with this. So here's a, here's a quick question for you guys. So we've just broken this up into a couple different areas. So here we go. Here, here's the ocean area. The marine area is zone C. The, the, the river freshwater area is zone A. And then B is this big mixing area that's going to be sometimes marine-like, sometimes river-like in, uh, in terms of what the water is floating around in it. So my question for you is, which, is, which of these regions is going to have the greatest salinity variation? A, B, or C? B, okay, good, right? Because it's tides are coming in, tides are going out. Um, so where do you think we're going to have the, the greatest diversity, the greatest number of, let's say, crabs? So crabs are a marine critter. C. Okay, I got one vote for C. I'm gonna make you guys vote. Okay, hold on. So here, so the first one is crabs. Or is, okay. Okay. So we have a vote that says, "Hey, these guys are really mobile. They'll be able to handle B." And then if a minority of folks think that maybe just out here, it's it's their their best area to be, uh, most suitable for them physiologically. Okay. What about a sea cucumber? Sea cucumber is an echinoderm. If you guys don't know what sea cucumbers are, they're an echinoderm that look like a slug and they go around they, they eat sediment and they poop out clean sediment so they they strip bacteria and stuff from the from the surface of sand grains and things like that so they're very slow moving they're also a marine critter so where do you guys think we're going to have the highest uh diversity etc of these guys okay so and why C? Why are sea cucumbers going to be abundant in C? For the same reason. Right. So there you go. So, so here's, here's a, a theoretical estuary. So we have uh, fresh water coming in, and there's ocean water over here. And so this fresh water is going to tend to create a lens. Okay? So we're going to have the stratification of salinity. Uh, the fresh water is going to be less dense, so it's going to tend to float on top. The seawater is going to tend to be um, um, heavy and is going to be underneath it. So what we're going to see over time is we're going to see this is going to move in and out with either rains and or with the tides. And so, for example, in high tide, we have um, there's, there's a lot of pre essentially a lot of seawater shoving into the estuary. The, the, the high tide tide is rising, right? At low tide. The, the tide is going out to sea, in effect, and the fresh water is dominating. So, you, so basically, you guys are right. So crabs are going to do really well because um, they, they're, they're highly mobile, right? So if it, oh my God, if the salinity is changing over the course of a couple hours, they can, what? They can just crawl, 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 you know, sidewalk, either, either to a different part of the estuary or maybe even just right outside the water and chill out in the air for a little bit if, if need be. Sea cucumbers don't, can't do that. They don't move that fast. So if we took a sea cucumber and changed it and put it in an estuary and then all of a sudden it got really fresh, he would essentially pop. He would blow up like a balloon and boom. And it would, it would be, uh, yeah, sea cucumber. I don't know what we call that. Confetti? I don't know what the term for that would be. Oh, yes, yeah, right. Oh, good. Yeah, so they can regenerate the, their viscera. So, so, they're, they're intense. so some sea cucumbers, when they react to being, um, in fact, in the Cook Islands, people eat that they love. It's a delicacy. So they scoop up these sea cucumbers and they squeeze them. And essentially their intestines, like it looks like spaghetti, comes out of their uh, <laughs> orifice, we'll say. And then and people just eat it like, rah, 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 and they eat it. Uh, I, I I don't, but uh, you know some people they, they like it. So it's it's supposed to be great. Um, so um, yeah, so so that is in theory that doesn't have to necessarily kill the sea cucumber. 
you could let the guy back in the water and it could regenerate its it, those tissues to an extent. So some species use that clearly as a defense mechanism, like a salamander would cast off its tail maybe when a cat goes to grab it and the tail is wiggling back and forth and the cat's like, what does this hurt? And then the, and then the you know, he's crawling under a rock in, in that time, let's say. Um, these guys can regenerate that. Although in this case, if we dropped a guy in a fresh part of the estuary, it would, that he would pop. He wouldn't be able to regenerate that. Um, and so, right, okay, so the, these guys these guys don't have active regulation, whereas the crabs can walk around the estuary and, and they can self-select where they could be very, very quickly, respond to very quick, rapid changes in salinity. And so this is what we tend to see in terms of where estuary critters are distributed. These are critters that um, only can live in marine, like the sea cucumber. These are critters that can only live in fresh water. And, and we see the greatest um, range of critters in, in organisms that can adapt to this range of salinity. And you can adapt by, um, because of your physiology potentially, or because of your behavior, because of your ability to physically move quickly out of one particular uh, salinity concentration area to another. And so this is what we see, which you guys correctly predicted. Most of you guys, so sea cucumbers are most uh, going to do their do their do out in the ocean. Crabs are going to go crazy here. So the reason that crabs, even though they're marine critter, aren't most abundant in sea is because they're crabs. They're tasty. Everybody loves to eat crabs. So if they're out here, absolutely, we have lots of crabs in the ocean. Absolutely, crabs can do well out here. But everybody's going to want to eat them, right? If we come into this, this area here, um, because they have the ability, they have the physiology that they can tolerate this, a lot of their predators cannot. A lot of the fish predators can't come into this area. If they come, the, the, the fish predators are going to be restricted to zone C. So... Um, so if you're a crab, oh my God, we mentioned before that, that estuaries are incredibly productive, wetlands are incredibly productive areas on our planet. So if you're a crab, you can get at some of that productivity, some of those pieces of plants, some of those other little critters you want to prey on. So if you can get in there and you can handle it, it's a great place to eat. And also, there aren't as many things, I mean, there, there are herons and stuff and birds that would want to eat you, so that's true. It's not predator-free. But at least a lot of your traditional marine predators have a hard time getting getting at you. So another example of how this gross physics of water or the ocean has direct impacts on the distribution of organisms and, and critters. So so we saw that with with stuff we might want to mine. We're seeing this with where critters are have oriented themselves in the um, ocean, etc. Okay, um, we can talk a little bit more about temperature now. So that was a little bit about salinity, a little bit about temperature. Um, you, everybody knows warm-blooded, cold-blooded, which are lame words that don't accurately describe what's going on. Um, but generally, when, when people say that warm-blooded, cold-blooded, what we're, they're getting at is some critters actively maintain their body temperature within a very narrow range and, and they control that. You and I are, um, are one of those, right? So we're going to keep our body temperature, quote unquote, warm blooded. Uh, this guy right here, same temperatured, same temperatured critters, same, same, same temperature -er -ers. Right? So all of our body, all of our digestive processes, all of our reproductive processes, all of our brain processes, all this stuff is designed to operate um, at, a, at a pretty, within a pretty narrow range of temperatures. So if we're cold, you and I are going to start shivering, right? If we're hot, we're going to start sweating so we can cool ourselves down, etc. cetera. Uh, other things we have um, are... Um, at least partially 
their, their, their internal body temperature is at least partially dictated by the external environment's temperature. This would be the so-called, quote unquote, cold-blooded critters. And so in general, um, water temperature, so the warmer we go, the more active our, um, we have a higher Q10, the more actively we can process energy, eliminate wastes, all this and that. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just say that. So, right, you, get, you guys get all this. And so temperature, as we mentioned before, also not, ju not just affects the physiology of critters or dictates what kind of critters you might expect to see in an area, but it also influences density, as we saw. It, 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 uh, wa the ocean is a big, giant thermal pump moving temperature around the, the planet, etc. Perhaps one of the most extreme examples of temperature's influence on organisms' distributions would be um, uh, just the, the classic case that gave birth to modern quantitative ecology, and that is intertidal ecology. These are some of Joe Connell's famous experiments from the 1960s, where uh, he looked at, um, okay, so that first genus is pronounced thamelus. So the CH is silent just to totally screw with you. So, so it's pronounced as if it's, it's T is the first letter in the, in the genus, but the, so it's th thamelus and balanus. And, uh, and so here we have, I have it in a cartoon form. And so what we see is when balanus is by itself, um, uh, they, they grow everywhere on the, on the rocky intertidal, right? These are barnacles. These are basically little shrimp that have put a bunch of crazy glue on their head and then stood on their head on the rock. They've glued their head to the rock and then they've made a shell around them. So a barnacle is essentially a, a shrimp with his head glued to the rock. It's a crustacean. They have valves right here uh, on, uh, uh, in the, uh, near the opening of their, or at the opening of their um, shell volcano and they clamp that tightly and so they can squeeze it really tight and when, it, when, they're dr when there's no water around they can um, resist drying for long periods of time. So these guys are, uh, are in this part of the ocean. What we see is when balanus is by itself it grows everywhere. But when we, ha excuse me, when thamelus is by itself it grows everywhere. When we introduce balanus though, thamelus does not uh, grow everywhere. Do you guys remember the story of this from your intro bio class? why this happens this way? What's that? Niches, kind of, but what's that? Yeah, it's the classic case of competition. Okay. So what this is saying is when Thamelus is a by itself and it grows everywhere, it's saying that Thamelus really wants to be everywhere, right? If, if given its choice, it wants to be everywhere. But when we introduce a competitive species, uh, it doesn't do as well. So Balanus outcompetes it. It grows faster. It squeezes it out. It, it, it is able to, to be a better competitor for space than Thamelus. So Balanus is the superior competitor. But Balanus just doesn't kick the butt of Thamelus 100%. It doesn't eliminate Thamelus and why? What, why? So balanus is the superior competitor, but how come we don't, in this case, how come we don't have 100% balanus? That's right. That's right, because they have different thermal tolerances. They have different tolerances to drying out. So we see, for example, in areas, and this is first noticed in the ocean, but we see this in other areas too. But classically in the intertidal, in these areas of a very strong environmental gradient, in this case, we're going from air to water, from relatively even temperatures to relatively extreme temperatures, however you want to, however you want to think about it. Those are all, all um, fair descriptions. What we see is um, uh, the we have the di biological diversity that we have 
because of differing abilities to tolerate stress. So, balanus is the superior competitor. So what we see is the bottom edge of the distribution of these guys is dictated by biology, by life forms interacting with one another. The upper edge of the distribution is dictated by the abiotic world, by temperature, let's say, by drying, by desiccation. So, why isn't balanus down here below? Why isn't balanus down here underwater? Because it's, it's predators when eat it. So there's a biological control on its downside. Why isn't thamelus growing down here? Because of the biological interaction of balanus squeezing it out, competing it, being the superior competitor. Uh, what's determining how high in the intertidal balanus can grow? It's physiological tolerance to drying and heat. What's determining how high thamelus can go? It's physiological tolerance to drying or heat. Does that make sense? So this temperature, salinity, all these things have major large scale patterns across the ocean and the globe and influence energy movement and climate and this and that. But they also have these very localized effects on where we see organisms and how organisms interact with one another. Just like we saw uh, differences in water masses with, um, uh, from salinity we were talking about before, we can see the same thing in terms of temperature. So this is a thermocline. Again, a rapid change over a short <coughs> period of time <coughs> in the parameter. In this case, temperature. So uh, this is our first introduction to depth graphs. So here we go. We're going from low to high on the x-axis, that's, that's normal. But when we talk about stuff down into the ocean, what we typically do is instead of putting the x-axis on the bottom of the figure as we traditionally do, we usually put it on the top. So it makes more sense. Because we usually think about, since we're surface dwelling organisms, we usually think about going into the ocean, right? And so, so um, while it's perfectly right to say low to high, low to high, we usually invert the y-axis here, right? So instead of going from low, meaning zero foot of depth or zero meters of depth to 10 or 20 or 30, it makes more intuitive sense for us to have the, 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 the shallowest area here, the depth, let's say, be zero and then get larger. So usually when we talk about these ocean profiles, the x-axis is as you guys have come to expect, but the y-axis is usually inverted. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. So that's what we're looking at here. So here we've, uh, somebody's started here and we've, in this cartoon fashion, we've measured the temperature and the temperature is, is warm. And then we're kind of go, 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 go. And then whoop, over a relatively short range, in this case depth, we see a huge swing, a tw in this case, almost 20 degrees Celsius temperature change. And then after this period, it's, it, has, it doesn't change. It's pretty, above it, it's pretty consistent whether we're at this depth or this depth or this depth, it's the same. Here, this depth, this depth, this depth, this depth, it's basically the same. So um, this, and we see these clines all over the place. Now, is anybody a scuba diver or a snorkeler? So have you experienced, Michaela, have you experienced thermoclines? Yeah. So, so how, how, how narrow can this depth range be? I Right. So I, one of my jobs when I was an undergrad was to work for um, uh, this friend of mine who's now a professor at Northridge. And I spent all summer sitting on the bottom of a cove, many summers actually, on a cove in Catalina counting gobies. That is super interesting for the first 40 hours you do it. But, you know, after hour 300, it becomes a little mind numbing. So because we're doing behavioral work, we weren't supposed to move, right? If we move, the fish are like, what the hell? And they, they do different things. So the idea is you go down with a scuba tank and you essentially sit on the bottom of the ocean and just look. <laughs> and then you have a, a slate right in front of you and you, you put your hand on the slate with your pencil and so you can make tick marks. He did that, okay, he did that. Then after, you know, an hour or two, you say, 
it starts to get hard to breathe. And you like look at your pressure gauge and oh my God, I'm out of air. And then you go to the surface, you change, change your tank, you come back down and the same thing. It's super intellectually stimulating. <laughs> so because we wouldn't move um, and you're in water, even though it's relatively warm Southern California water, you get cold. You get cold really quickly. So we had thick wetsuits on, but even with thick wetsuits, you get cold. And so, and so a lot of times, this was typically at about 30 feet. Most of these things are about 30, 30, 40 feet in this, um, uh, in, in what's called Big Fisherman Cove out on Catalina Island. And you get cold and you're like, damn, my, my hands are getting cold. And sometimes it gets hard to write. A lot of times a thermocline would be right at your head or, or very close to your, to your, where your head was. So I could take my hand and slowly, because I want to scare the fish, but slowly move my hand, like punch up like this, just raise it on my head. And that might be three or four degrees warmer than where my head is. So these thermoclines can be just inches thick. They don't have to be, you know, they could be meters long or longer, but these, these, these differences can be really, really dramatic. So essentially what we're talking about is one pocket of water here and another pocket of water right here. When we humans look at the ocean, we see big bunch of water. It's all this big bunch of water. It is not. It has a tremendous amount of structure. That structure comes from all this, this, this in effect, different, different um, think of it as a bunch of little balloons jammed together that make up the ocean, right? So for you and I, we're big, and I'm bigger than most of you guys, um, we're, we're, um, we're big. So this, this change in temperature, we, know, we already talked about how change in temperature can change density, right? So this is a big thing. This, is, this, makes, me, this makes my hand feel warmer when I put it up here. But I can, I can punch, because I'm so macho, I can punch my hand, yes, indeed, through this barrier of water. That's how strong I am, right? I can do that. But if we're a gelatinous zooplankton, maybe it can't. We'll, we'll pick this up later. But, but suffice it to say, um, you can make a, a jellyfish explode by finding a thermocline that's like this. Because, again, it's a different density of water. Now, our, our fingers, our, our fingernails, our muscles, they're denser than that waterway. I can punch right through that water, right? I, I'm, I'm contained and I can, I can do it up. A jellyfish is essentially seawater with a little teeny thin membrane around it, right? It doesn't have a bunch of bones. It doesn't have a big, huge, you know, skin, uh, you know, mammalian skin surrounding it. So what you can do is if we had a jellyfish, I'll maybe try to find a video for you guys next time. If we had a jellyfish and we're right here and there was a strong, a strong density cline or thermocline, I can go woof and make a wave with my hand that would, you know, make the jellyfish, you know, move. And if you do it, I'm not saying I've done this, but I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying I, I've heard tell that if you do that, it's an effective, effectively just like throwing it right into a rock and the guy will explode and die. So I'm not saying that to encourage you guys to torture gelatinous zooplankton, but I'm saying that, that the ocean has a tremendous amount of structure that you and I don't perceive because we're land critters and we're generally big. Many of the critters in the ocean are small. Many of the critters in the ocean live their whole life in the ocean. So they don't have the kind of structures like bones, say, that you and I have that help us move around about on a two-dimensional surface, they are living in a three-dimensional world. So we'll, we'll, we'll pick, we'll conclude this up. We'll conclude this next time.